full of uh, uh, Phyllis. That was, uh, you held your own. You held your own. And we're, we're going to change tact a bit. Uh, and uh, uh, Aaron will speak to us uh, about uh, Lynn's work and his work with Lynn and with the estate. Aaron? That's right. Um, I wonder if I've got a presentation and hoping that we can run it manually. Because otherwise, some of my points won't uh, necessarily be as illuminated. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, I've got some time to, well, I just switch it, but I've got some meeting in here, so we'll see whether it starts rolling on its own while I'm talking. Uh, first of all, I'd really like to thank everyone uh, here at Bear County Ontario uh, for inviting me to speak um, and for organizing this beautiful symposium. Uh, it's not for us, Ottawa. Ottawa, Bear County. What did I say? NGO. NGO is that? Acronyms go itch every time. Ottawa Art Gallery uh, is absolutely where we are. And thank you so much for uh, offering us this opportunity to, to be here and, and discuss and celebrate the uh, As Glenn already said, I'm uh, Aaron Gerbich. I'm a registrar for Old Corporate Gallery in Toronto and, and really it's primarily uh, representative gallery. And I had the great privilege of working really closely with Lynn on a period of about eight years uh, there. And Lynn and I developed a, a working relationship where I think she came to rely on me uh, quite a bit to help track and manage her inventory. Uh, and in the last two years, I've been working with her digital files to create a comprehensive digital archive of her work. Uh, so in that sense, I guess I might be considered one of the keepers of the flame with respect to that archive. And I hope that. Uh, I can speak to that a little bit, and, uh, and that some of my personal reminiscences that I'm going to share with you will kind of open a window onto uh, some of the breadth of Lynn's work over the course of her career. Um, and it seems like we've got manual control, so that's great. <laughs> um, my first encounter with Lynn's work was uh, almost immediately after starting at Olga Corporate Gallery uh, with an internship that I did there. And we received a large shipment of uh, vintage black and white prints of Lens, which I believe were the contact prints that Anne was speaking about earlier. They were uh, coming from PPOW. And uh, my first job, one of my first jobs there was to inventory them. And uh, I immediately became very engaged with Lynn's work. Um, I was struck in, you know, right off the bat by a lot of the humor in some of her photos. There was just something really uh, odd about them, and you come to realize it's some of it has to do with the time and place, um, some of it has to do with uh, out of scale objects. Uh, there's one in particular I'm thinking of here. Oh, this one, uh, the giant hat. Um, odd combinations. Uh, someone mentioned kitsch earlier, and I think that the kitsch that may that some people may perceive in, in Lynn's work, uh, again, maybe only reveals itself over, over decades as, as trends in, in decor, etc., have changed. And it's not, uh, it's possible that, you know, a decade from now, we might look at the more recent images and feel the same way. And I don't think that that's ever uh, an intention of the work. I think it's just a side effect of the pro progression of time. Um, and these were some of my favorite uh, first encounters with Lynn's work that immediately, you know, either made me laugh or made me really curious about uh, her intentions as a photographer. Both of these. Uh, so they piqued my curiosity, and uh, I spent a lot of time thereafter going through Lynn's catalog of work and trying to make sense of these images and placing them within. Uh, the canon of her work. At the time, I didn't have a lot of uh, personal knowledge uh, of art history and even less contact with contemporary art. And Lynn's, working with Lynn's photos was really a, a primary gateway for me into that world um, and allowed me to become a, more fully engaged with both uh, the contemporary art world and uh, the, the art historical. 
context for her photos. Uh, so my first experience of getting to know Lynn was really getting to know her photographs. Uh, coming from a theater background, uh, I always loved the scale of Lynn's work, particularly, uh, and, and the color work, uh, maybe most notably, as you know, her portal, her frame, was almost like a proscenium arch, but it was something that you could almost step through into. Not quite, never quite, because the scale wasn't perfectly realistic. Uh, but it, it set us back just enough to become studious observers of the space, instead of active participants in the set piece, as it were. Um, our daily experience of spaces like the ones that have been photographed, uh, they, they want to make us passive observers. I think we've touched on this already, that we can go through spaces like this all the time in our day-to-day -day life and never particularly criticize them. But the way that Lynn has focused our gaze upon them changes the way that we inspect them and really uh, put them under a higher volume of criticism. Uh, I'm consistently more and more aware, I think, of when I enter a space that I think would maybe constitute a Lynn Cohen photograph. In, uh, it was 2009, we were preparing uh, for an exhibition of Lens at Old Recorder Gallery to open for the Contact Festival that happens in Toronto. Uh, and Olga had already more or less decided on the layout of, of how she would ideally like the photos to be presented around the gallery. And uh, Lynn oftentimes agreed with, with Olga's uh, curating of the show, but Olga would always allow uh, Lynn's sort of final say. And in this particular case, we had, I believe we had uh, all the photographs already hung, and then came in for her, her final approval of the exhibition. And uh, she went around the room looking at everything very, very carefully, and she came back to Olga and she said, it's beautiful, may I make one change? Hmm. And Olga said, of course, you're the artist, you know, we do, we do what you want. And, uh, Lynn asked if we could put one of her favorite photos from her most recent work right in the middle of the longest wall of the gallery, which is Olga's big feature wall that she loves to have just so. And this particular image, uh, I believe it was a photograph from Cuba. Uh, it's got this plant and a piano against this beautiful mural. Um, was not Olga's favorite <laughs> image. But of course we we did exactly as Lynn requested. And I think that this plays into how um, Lynn really wanted her work to be viewed. She didn't want everything to be easy. She loved to have something in there that was odd or uncomfortable that would make you stop in your tracks and consider uh, what you were looking at. Um, and I think this is partly maybe ambitious on Lynn's part. Uh, but it was also very seriously rooted in, in her intentions for the presentation of the work um, and for how she wanted her audiences to view and react to the work, um, much like the way she intended for the work to be framed in a very uh, singular way. Uh, she was very focused on the display beyond the camera lens. You know, it wasn't just a matter of snapping the photo and having it be shown however someone else decided to show it, it was always Lynn's own vision. Um, I'll speak a bit now about how my working relationship with Lynn was not always made easy, and, and I think curators uh, that have dealt with her on numerous occasions have felt some of this um, about the difficulties involved in searching through a database of hundreds of works named Untitled, <laughs> or dozens of works named Spa, uh, so many of Lynn's photographs then came to have, you know, up to three or four different sort of codified titles that she gave to them, which we used for internal reference. And uh, they were her private lexicon, really, and they were the clues that she used to, to perform searches in the vast uh, labyrinthine archive of files, of works that were filed away in her, her own memory banks. And they were often titles referring to significant works in art history 
or artists whose sensibilities uh, aligned with perhaps a photograph of hers in a certain way or a color palette. Uh, and I thought that I'd bring some, a couple of examples of these to your attention. Um, she would use, Of order. Um, this one, for instance, uh, the code name she had for this was Judd. And uh, I brought a, a Judd example that I think you know, puts it pretty squarely in context for why. Uh, but they were great visual cues for, for finding images amongst a myriad of images that may have some other subject matter. Um, there's a picture called uh, Codified Deep and Corn. <laughs> and then uh, I managed to find this one that I thought lined up pretty squarely with it. Um, and then I go back. In, uh, in some cases, um, like I said, there were up to three or four different secret titles for these works. This picture, which is uh, officially a military installation in the 1990s, had alternate names like military targets and target wallpaper, John's wallpaper, and classroom number nine. And then some of them had uh, sort of more fun descriptors, like this is fat chair, <laughs> or aluminum foil bed, which is maybe one of the more ominous spa images I think that she had. Um, Having an intimate acquaintance with Lynn's body of work uh, led me to one revelation over the course of her illness that didn't necessarily strike me at the time, but um, as I've looked at uh, sort of the later images of hers, it, um, the, the idea cemented in my mind. And I, uh, another one might know that the cancer that was in Lynn's brain uh, had affected her eyesight. And I don't exactly know what the timeline of her declining vision looked like, but I know that at a certain point, her vision had become more or less limited to one eye. Uh, and it was sometime after her diagnosis that I began to notice a marked increase in the color intensity of the photographs that she was producing. Uh, and she had begun to revisit some of her previous work and was reprinting some of those images on a larger scale, the, the largest scale that she ever produced. Uh, one particular image, spa uh, abstraction, uh, which then privately referred to as the Richter Spa, uh, was reprinted with what I noticed as a, a significant uptick uh, in the color saturation. Uh, I've got a slide. So this was the original 2002 print, and this was the 2013 print. Um, there's another uh, image that comes to mind, which uh, Anne used earlier, the, uh, the red couch from Venice in 2011. And uh, I thought these were a couple of the most demonstrative uh, in terms of the uptick in color saturation that I saw in, in the later work. But the images also uh, were really stand out for me in that I think they were some of the most visually striking photographs of Lynn's career. And they continue to resonate uh, strongly with people. Um, it was at uh, the 2013 exhibition, Looking Forward and Looking Back, uh, at Olga Cooper Gallery that I was uh, talking with Lynn and Olga in, in the kitchen about, uh, about the exhibition. And uh, Lynn was talking about, about the future and said that uh, she really, uh, her goal was to make it to her 70th birthday. And <laughs> Olga suggested making one of her famous um, shooting range images with a target and with with 70 as a target image and something about that rattled around in my brain uh, and I went out to look at the uh, at the exhibition again and uh, just to confirm something in my mind and I went back into the into the kitchen uh, and interrupted their conversation and I said you know you've already made the image when this was uh, an image that was in the exhibition and there's a, there's a blackboard in the corner mm -hmm. and it has 70 plus on it. And uh, several times over the, the ensuing months, 
Olga would have me send the 70 plus to Lynn in an email just as a, a goal and encouragement. Uh, Lynn was someone that I interacted with certainly on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis, and uh, she's greatly missed. Uh, and I take a great deal of heart in the fact that she's still making me laugh when I see her photographs, and I still hear her voice in my head when I look at the photos. Um, I hear her wishing me a bon weekend, and I wish you all a bon weekend. Thank you very much, Aaron. And perhaps we can now open it to the floor to uh, uh, comment, question. Uh, there is quite a bit of content in those three presentations. And maybe I'll start. Um, over uh, well, the, 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 this morning's presentation by Andrew, Andrew referred to uh, Lynn's early success as a printmaker. And uh, he didn't say anything about the prints in his oral presentation. And so I asked him over lunch, firstly, whether some of these prints still exist, and they do, and what the subject matter was, and there were early home furnishing catalogs. catalogs. And Phyllis Lambert, uh, in her uh, video, quoted from Lynn of those early interiors being like home furnishing catalogs. I thought that was a fascinating comment. A Andrew, can you, can you say anything about those early prints? She, she took material from these catalogs, like CS catalog. You know, and I think they, they still do them, but they did much more in those days. CS and various other companies were sent out these catalogs. Um, a lot of them had line drawings and things like that. And they would take, um, and she would take the, that and use that as the basis for the, uh, uh, the prints. Um, she, it was a time of pop art, you know, and so she was very interested in the, that sort of pop um, commercial imagery, um, and she she exploited that. Uh, but there was another thing which only struck me recently. It was that she was very interested in the blacks of, of early etchings. And she, she was very proud of the, some of her etchings were the blackest etchings. They didn't have white parts, but the blacks were very black. And it struck me that that was her interest in materials again, you know, the materiality. Of it, um, but uh, it was um, it came from consumer, what you call consumer patterns. That was where the main um, uh, imagery came from, and uh, that, of course, that you can see some of that in the, uh, in the later work, especially because when she suggests the silhouettes and things like that. There's another thing that color. Thompson here does wonderful um, uh, art stuff. And one of the things we did for many years afterwards was she, she used the fax machine a lot. And she used the same imagery from these sorts of catalogs, also from technical manuals. Uh, and she would always have those at, uh, on the um, fax, fax machine, fax paper, and then she would write something whoever it was, but she would always have some imagery, images. If you Google, I think Carla has them, if you Google Carla Thompson, I think she has on her web page these things, and they were very much like that. I don't know whether Carla would know, but did she ever talk to you about that? Uh, no, she never did. Never did. Uh, there's a similarity there. And the, between the fax, the fax material and the uh, uh, colors of work. For example, she was very interested in that. Also, postcards, she was sending me those things. That sort of material, the 
my interpretation of the book. And Lynn did that as well. She went around, you know, kind of a Duchampian effect, and, and forced things into the realm of art that, that didn't belong there or weren't comfortable being there, but were raised to the status of art because she did it. She made them into objects with meaning by the very fact that she framed them. So that, I guess that's my larger question and uh, my larger point there. And Ben, can I follow up on that? Um, Phyllis Lambert spoke about Lynn's deceptive neutrality. Uh, and is it that deceptive neutrality what enables her to achieve the framing or the conversion of objects into subjects? I'm trying to connect the two thoughts. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking, uh, I mean, these are, again, uh, complicated thoughts, I guess. You know, the, the image that Anne started with, I think I showed it as well, just the, um, the colored panels in the, uh, the, I guess it's a movable panel in a, in a conference room setting or something like that. As an architect, I love that image. But that image to me, along with probably the last image, the last image I was going to show, which is just that spider glass wall with just a little reveal at the bottom of it, an absolutely empty image. Those to me are sort of sublime architectural images in a way, and they, but Lynn never, I mean, she rarely did that. There was always something in the room. You know, this, this chair that ended up there. And, 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 and uh, now I forget what you asked, but... Uh, well, you heard the, the deceptive neutrality yeah. uh, that Phyllis was speaking about. And, and, and then you got this framing converting an object into a subject matter. And is the deceptive neutrality the means by which she achieves that? Well, I would say... Think here. I mean, Lynn made choices about what she would, what she would photograph and what she didn't, uh, and the places look like they just happened to happen, but in fact, indeed, they were carefully considered and very thought about. There was, there was no question that that she saw, um, if I can use the term, higher potential in some places than in others, <laughs> um, uh, and, and it was on those places that she she operated, as it were, uh, by bringing in the, the technology and, and, and performing this kind of sleight of hand or transformative act. Um, the fact that those spaces appear to be spaces that don't warrant being photographed um, is, I think, what, what, uh, what Phyllis was saying is deceptive neutrality, that, that we, we uh, clearly, Lynn saw something in them already, but not only did she see a kind of a latent potential in them, but then she went back and, as I said, what Lynn does is she prosthetically enhances neutral environments to be kind of super environments in a way. Um, through 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 the operation that she performs on them, so I you know you, you want to dismiss them right away, but you can't because the, the artist has sort of caught them and already made them, pulled them out of the everyday. Um, uh, I, maybe does that at least come in close to them? Maybe a comment from the floor. I just have one thing to Sometimes people thought that Lynn would just go to a place and photograph. <coughs> Wherever she went, she could find something. This wasn't true. She um, struggled, struggled a lot. And this set her apart from documentary photographers, I think. Because documentary photographers usually they go to a place and find the best image they can take and take it. But often we would go, I, I, I would try, you know, if I could work in a car and I could work in a car, take it to someone who would drive maybe you know, a couple hundred kilometers, and um, she wouldn't find anything. And uh, so for her, it was very selective, but it was okay. And also, it's, I remember being in Havana, we were walking through a hotel, and she said, I photographed here. And I said, oh, that's interesting, what do you that? And she said, oh, okay. And I didn't see it. You know, I didn't see it. And then until she pointed that out, I thought, oh, there's something there. But for her, um, for her, she did. She looked very, very hard. She photographed. She didn't photograph everything. She didn't. Um, and off what she photographed, she only selected a small amount. She had to stand up. She had to have those those qualities. She took it from me, an ordinary thing, to, to uh, something uh, to her. Um, and the, there's a big difference between, um, between Lynn and the, she was never a typologist, but she never went through like professions and did everything 
you know, they would do everything. She was never that way. She, um, though she did spas, she did them um, only till they, as she said, they, they, only when they had secrets. And when they lost the secrets, she stopped. But she had lots of things going all the time. And one other thing which is um, uh, prompted a thought from what you said, Ben. Um, uh, you know, the two you said are very, they get very aesthetic. Um, and uh, she always wanted to stay that side of it. Um, at the end of her life, she did try to get closer. And it was an object to get close, closer to the work without it becoming his head. And um, that's a tricky, a tricky thing. Um, and she always wanted it, well, not to, not to, so it would be beautiful. Now, there are some pictures which are just, just beautiful, okay? And um, he's, he's there to sell out right <laughs> off <laughs> But that's not what she was interested in. Um, uh, and that was something she, she really did think a lot about. And she wanted to stay always this side of the aesthetic. And, um, uh, otherwise, it's in a way it's easy stuff. And she didn't want easy stuff. And I think. Um, it's, all, it's like that garbage can just finds its way in and kind of preempts the, the, yeah. the scene as pure composition or pure yeah. aesthetics in a way. And, and because it finds its way in, um, it becomes this inadvertent subject matter, like something that's been caught inadvertently in there. Uh, and all of a sudden, because it's like somebody wanders out on stage, didn't realize there's a whole audience there, and it's like, oh, uh, <laughs> kind of caught the headlights in. And the two chairs talking to one another. Talking to one another. And then they become subject. Absolutely. Yes, um, Lily. Hi. Um, I apologize, I wasn't here this morning, so what I'm about to ask may in fact have been covered this morning. But I'd like to ask you to comment on what I found as an interesting um, word that's not been used about Lynn so far this afternoon, and that's surreal. Don't you think there's elements of surreal um, and not really, but the nightmare um, in her work? Or is that not something that people feel at all? Dan, do you want to? Aaron, Aaron. I think that the surreal, we haven't necessarily addressed it today, but I think that uh, there are people who have touched upon uh, the notion of the surreal in Lynn's work. Um, you particularly see, as I mentioned early on in my presentation, in, in sort of outscale uh, objects. Uh, there's one particular object, a photograph from 2007 that I can think of uh, that she called mutant lamps. And they were these, it was in a lobby. Yeah. With uh, the chair. Oh, yeah. And, and these, yeah, lamps that are, you know, they're aliens, they're out to get you. Um, and I think that it's in those kind of charged moments uh, in one's photography that you definitely do detect uh, the surreal. Yeah, I, 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 Lily, I'm gonna say, yeah, it's, I, I think I started at somewhere saying, the mark of any good work of art is just it throws off all kinds of interpretations. The thing that I love about Lynn's work is that it, it Almost whatever you want to talk about, you can use Lynn's work to talk about it. Just <laughs> surreal is absolutely right. I mean, the Duchamp, I think Duchamp comes, you know, he has some surrealist um, associations or affiliations for sure. Uh, the notion of juxtaposition, which is the key mechanism of, of surrealism, uh, is always there in her work. Um, so, so absolutely, it's surreal. It's that uncomfortable juxtaposition of two things that don't belong together, or the idea that that image or that environment doesn't belong to the goddamn frame in the first place. So already there's this weird, weird juxtaposition of things going on. Yes, Michael. Uh, there was a comment that Lynn made a number of years ago that I remember that strikes on two levels. 
one is she said to me at one point, because I was saying, some of these spaces are, are not easy to get to, on a, on a, not just on a logistic level, but on a legal level. And so she said to me at one point, yes, one of the things I have to learn to do is to become a real estate agent. Uh, and what she was talking about was a certain kind of negotiation that had to happen in order to get access to this material. The interesting thing that when you look at the work is that same kind of issue comes to the presentation of the work, which is that in order to get into the work, whether it's through the use of the proscenium or in the later work, there is an actual attempt at the apron stage to get into the work. Somehow the viewer, for myself anyway, when I look at the work, there's a certain kind of negotiation that I have to go through in order to get access to this work. Whether it's anticipation of the space that do I have the privilege of getting into, or the anticipation of a ceremony that I'm witnessing the end remains of, I'm, and in a sense, embarrassed to get into, because, my God, there's too much evidence here that is proving too, too um, problematic for me to be allowed to witness. And yet she, she has the courage to go into that space, negotiate the access, and demand of the viewer the same kind of, of, of attitude in actually looking at the work. And Lynn, Lynn had a favorite saying when people would ask her, you know, how do you get into these spaces? She said, that's, that's the wrong question. <laughs> how do you get out of them? <laughs> 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 you should know that the hardest place that she, the most difficult place for her to get into was the psychology department of the University of Harvard. <laughs> 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 there was a hand up on the uh, table over on the, my right. Yes. Oh. Just in relation to that, um, Ben, you mentioned um, the sense of panic. You talked about meaning and how it hides behind whatever it can find. But also, I think you mentioned that it roams around um, across the sea. Oh, no, no, you say it roams around the sea in a state of panic. I've just done an absolutely <laughs> wonderful tattoo stand. Yeah, uh, thank you for catching that. That was one of my favorite ones. <laughs> There is a kind of panic when you look at Lynn's work because you, you literally don't know what to make of it. This is, a, I think, that meaning effect. She produces something that says, this is meaningful. You stand in front of it saying, I, I feel it's meaningful, but I can't figure out, I can't make it make sense anymore. So this huge anxiety. Um, I mean, I, in a certain discourse in art, again, I come back to Hegel. Um, Hegel says that the, the function of art is to take us from consciousness to self-consciousness. Whether we still agree with that or not, I, I don't know. Whether that's, anyway, I defer to my... Nothing about it. Nothing about it. <laughs> Wittgenstein would probably hate it. Uh, so anyway, uh, but it does. It puts you, I mean, so you have that anxiety. When you look at these figures, as I say, those, like the chairs or the trash cans, have that anxiety. That same anxiety, of the curtains have, you know, that Noel film where the curtains open and all of a sudden, the, the dinner party is on stage or whatever. It's like they, they're not supposed to be there. They, they didn't need to be there, and therefore they're, they're being forced to fulfill a role that they're simply not up to fulfilling. And yet, it's like <laughs> you got it. You know? So it's, it's so those objects are anxious. They stand in for our anxiety, and there's this empathy that then gets set up between you and, and the trash can. Mm -hmm. so, uh, at least that's the way I feel. Diana.
particularly the European Yeah, places. yeah. And there are differences. I mean, do you think this is you know, Diana, maybe I can take a stab at that. Um, it may in part be uh, differences that you see in the later images, the earlier images being primarily in North America. Uh, but then I think of the Venice images, and those are almost back in Wisconsin. Uh, they're not elegant, um, and some of them are not elegant. So, by the Venice images, the red house image? The, the, the images in, the, in that series. Okay. The, that couch is, is, is elegant, but the... The, oh, the purple, the couch, yeah. yeah, and there's a, a purple one from that series. The, the color coloration is just dreadful, and that could be Wisconsin. Um, so maybe it's, it's a thinking over time, Andrew. Do you? Oh yeah. The I don't know whether that's true. Um, it would be interesting to line up a set of um, European pictures and a yeah. set of uh, North America because Lynn would always say um, it doesn't matter where it is. It would be, it would, it would be the same. Um, I 
But the, the problem is of that one is so much of it is the painting, and that painting is ugly. So I don't mind an ugly room, an ugly painting. I don't, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid that we're going to have to well, we're going to have to come to, to a conclusion as it's uh, a bit over our time. Uh, Stephanie, do you have uh, some things to say? Uh, mainly, I just want to say thank you so much to all the presenters today for your time. you for hosting us and providing our tech support. Uh, Israel, I don't know if you can hear me, but thank you. Um, so we are now, um, we hope you all join us for a reception at the Ottawa Art Gallery, which is at uh, 2 Daily Avenue, if you haven't been there before. Um, anyone who would like to take a taxi, um, Michelle Gewertz, our interim senior curator out there in the stripy shirt uh, just outside uh, has taxi chits and is calling cabs right now. Um, and if anyone would like to just walk and doesn't know the way, Ola Lusek in the back, wave Ola, uh, is going to lead a bit of a procession over there. So um, please join us, we'll have wine and nibbles and we can continue the conversation. Uh, and thank you again so much for coming. <laughs>